start with this. In my previous video, we talked about Ebony Bridges' shock upset loss to late replacement Miyo Yoshida and the possibility of a second fight on a rematch. If there is one. On the predication that there is one, what is it that Ebony Bridges needs to do differently against Miyo Yoshida, who dominated the pocket mid-range to inside and outfought her? Well, pressure fighters like Ebony, they really don't change much from one fight to the next. So that does make it a somewhat tough assignment, but there are one or two things that she can do differently. You have to remember that going into this fight, she hadn't fought in roughly a year, so she had ring rust to shake off. She won't have any. Wouldn't be the case in a second fight if the second fight goes down in the first quarter of the coming year. No ring rust to have to shake off would be a noticeable difference from one fight to the next because Ebony Bridges looked slow, her punches were flat, her timing was off. off. Those are obviously all characteristics that hamper a fighter's performance, the year marks of a fighter that hasn't fought in a while. And in the second fight, that may not be the case, but she can do somewhat differently than she did the first time out. Instead of applying pressure with punches, doubling and tripling up on the jab just to get countered for doing it. You counter. Catch and shoot while staying in character. Catch and shoot while being that mid-range to inside pressure fighter. Canelo Alvarez does it all the time, even though he's not an according to Hoyle textbook pressure fighter. He applies pressure in such a way where he's still defensively responsible. And the way that he does it is with presence rather than punches, just plain old punches. How do you do it? It's a strategy that's centered around presence, presence, being there with the other fighter, getting that fighter to throw based on proximity and then countering what they throw. Instead of you initiating the action with that double jab, that triple jab, you come forward behind that high guard, that tight guard, slipping, bobbing, rolling, and get close enough that they throw, close enough that they want to fight you off. And when they throw, you counter what they throw. Which is a little different than jabbing your way in in order to get close and thereby open up the opponent with punches. This way, you open up the opponent with presence because it was a little hard for Ebony to get close to Mio. So use the punches to your advantage. Use the fact that she's going to let her hands go. She's going to open up if you get close and focus on getting close, then countering. It's easier said than done, I know. All things are. But that is one way of tweaking the strategy, using what she's already learned about Miyo Yoshida, using it against her in a potential second fight, if there is one. As it stands, I've heard no new news about them plotting a course for a rematch in the coming year. But they might. They do. You can still stay in character with a strategy centered around baiting the opponent to throw so you can counter what they throw. Still applying pressure as to not break character because it's seldom ever a good idea for a pressure fighter to break character. They are who they are. And what if there is no rematch? Then Mio may end up fighting Shurita Metcalf for a second time. Shurita, who beat her in Mio's last fight, the one before this one, yet it's Mio Yoshida that ended up getting the title shot and thereby becoming the IBF champion. Funny old game, this boxing. It's funny how things happen. In the event that a rematch between them happens, what is it that Mio Yoshida needs to do differently to stay champion to ensure that Shurita doesn't beat her again? Well, she needs to get off to a earlier start and, and a better start. The drawback for Miyo Yoshida, who's a volume puncher and a mid-range to inside fighter is she doesn't have the fastest feet. It wasn't till after a few rounds, really the second half of the fight, that Miyo Yoshida really started to catch up to Sharita Metcalf and unload on the ropes, but that was after Sharita was a bit more tired and a bit more worn. She slowed down. If she can catch up to Sharita Metcalf, she can outwork her mid-range to inside. The trick is getting there. Thus, in camp, in preparation for the fight with Sharita, who she's already fought, what there needs to be a focus on is cutting off the ring. And you hear about that all the time, which is different than following your opponent around the ring in a straight line. What you're doing when you're cutting it off is cutting off the exits. You don't follow them. You don't move to where they are in the moment. You sidle to where they will be in the direction they're already going. So you meet them there. 
Just think of it as making your way to the nearest turnbuckle they're moving towards. For Mio Yoshida, there needs to be a sharp focus on that in camp. Otherwise, it's just going to be a repeat of the first fight. In the first fight that I picked Sharita Metcalf to win, I figured Sharita's light on her feet. So long as she's got energy, so long as she's got gas in the tank, she's going to move around the ring, pot shot from the outside, and make a slow-footed Mio Yoshida chase her around. It's one of the few instances that I've seen in recent memory where a pure boxer was able to out-hustle a volume puncher, a pressure fighter. It doesn't usually happen, but because Mio's got such slow feet and because Sharita is so long and limber, she was able to manage the distance for most of that fight. Even if it started to get away from her towards the end, she had already amassed a considerable lead. See if the IBF actually orders it, because if they don't, then I doubt it happens, and Mio will be free to run it back with Ebony. Likely for more money than she'd make defending the title against Sharita. Let's see what happens. You find yourself wishing you were still around, still boxing, and, had, uh, and having an opportunity to go at, Can uh, at Canelo Alvarez? Nah, I don't think he would have fought me. Why not? My name was never mentioned with Canelo Alvarez until he fought a common opponent. No, your name was never mentioned with Canelo Alvarez because by the time he was integrating himself into the middleweight division, you were integrating yourself into the light heavyweight division. Mm. And he fought Canelo, he fought Sergey Kovalev. Kovalev was, you know, Kovalev was, was I don't want to say he was shot, but he was on his way out the door. Tell the whole truth, why don't you? Sergey Kovalev was reigning WBO light heavyweight champion at the time, coming off a knockout win over then unbeaten Anthony Yard. That's what he was. And he wasn't the crusher at that point in time. And that's a strategic move, and that's what Canelo does. Strategic? You mean like retiring at age 33 when Bivol and Better Beaver are climbing up the ranks set to become your mandatory challengers? You mean strategic like retiring at age 33? The same age Canelo Alvarez is now, except he's not retired. And people get mad when you say that. He's earned the right and he's in a position with the fanfare that he has and having a country behind him to pick and choose who he wants to fight. That, that's cool. You can do that. The only problem I have is when we start mentioning name, mentioning his name with the all-time great Mexican fighters, the all-time great fighters all time. He's a four-division champion. He's a two-time lineal, two-time ring magazine, unified, undisputed champion, current reigning, and we're not supposed to mention his name with the all-time greats, but we should mention yours. I have a problem with that because I'm looking at the resume that he would have fought me because my name had never been mentioned in the same breath with Canelo Alvarez. And if I was active, I think it would have remained that way. What I think is that Andre Ward is a jealous fighter, jealous individual, and he always has been. Before, he was jealous of Gennady Golovkin and all of the fanfare that he was amassing circa 2015, making it about him and Golovkin, making it about them when Golovkin was at middleweight and Andre Ward was just coming off a two, two and a half year hiatus and integrating himself into the light heavyweight division. Golovkin was at middleweight and he was at light heavyweight. And the fuel the ammunition for all of this Gennady's trainer, Abel Semchez, Andre Vord, grasping at straws because Abel said that Gennady would beat anybody from 154 up to 168. It's the problem. Problem was that Andre wasn't even at 168 anymore. After two years away from the sport due to promotional issues, he had no choice but to move up to light heavy because he couldn't keep making super middle. So if you can't even keep making super middle, what are you worried about Gennady Golovkin and what Gennady Golovkin trainer says you're just grasping at straws to make the conversation about yourself you were doing it then with Gennady and you're doing it now with Canelo which is funny because back then he actually used to like Canelo what changed his mind Canelo Alvarez surpassed him he surpassed him as one of the all-time great super middleweights when he did what Andre Ward didn't do, when he became that division's undisputed champion. You will recall that Andre Ward actually went as far as lending his insights to Caleb Plant ahead of Caleb's fight with Canelo Alvarez. Ever since Canelo integrated himself into the super middleweight division where Andre Ward spent most of his career, ever since then, you could see a resentment. You could see that Andre Andre Vord harbored a resentment towards Canelo Alvarez, and I think what fueled it was that Canelo was outdoing him in his old division. 
Well, two times in Andre Ward's career. Two instances where he could have become an undisputed champion, like Canelo Alvarez at super middleweight. He was only one belt away from becoming undisputed there, but he was too good to travel to Canada to unify titles with Lucy and Butte. That was at 168. Up there at 175, he was only one belt away from becoming undisputed after the Kovalev fight. But instead of fighting Adonis Stevenson, he decided he should retire at the same age Canelo Alvarez is now. Except Canelo's not retiring, but Andre did. At 33 years old, they're still hounding Canelo Alvarez with the names of these fighters, these up-and-comers, that haven't proven anywhere near as much as he has, still demanding that he fight them. At that same age, that's when Andre Ward decided to bow out. That's when Andre Ward decided to call it a career, so it's strange that he actually has the nerve, the gall, to call out Canelo when, if you were serious about who you are and who you pretend to be, you wouldn't even be calling out Canelo. You'd be calling out the man that beat him. You'd be calling out Dimitri Bivol, who some people say you avoided. If Canelo were anything like Andre Ward, some unbeaten up-and-comer is coming through. Him versus that unbeaten up-and-comer wouldn't even be a conversation. If Canelo were anything like Ward, he'd retire at 33. But it is a conversation. It is a fight that can happen because Canelo isn't Andre Ward, and he doesn't pretend to be something that he isn't like Andre Ward. When there were two unbeaten up-and-comers coming through, two very good fighters, that's when Andre Ward strategically decided it's time to go. It's time to retire. And you notice that the energy is never towards the man that beat Canelo. Whether we're talking about Demetrius Andre, David Benavidez, or in this instance, Andre's been out of boxing for something like six or seven years. He's been in the analyst chair. And he's talking about Canelo. He's not talking about the man that beat Canelo, Dimitri Bivol. I mean, if it's about the best, fighting the best, then shouldn't you be issuing this call out to the man that beat Canelo? No, right? Andre Ward is yet another shining example that just because you keep the O, just because you have a quote unquote unbeaten record, that doesn't mean it goes a long way with the people that matter. The paying public, the portion of the public that pays to see boxing because Andre Ward, for what success he had at Super Metal and Light Heavy, he was never that big a draw. He was always in somebody else's shadow, which is why he harbors so much resentment. He feels entitled. Him retiring undefeated, unbeaten record, that might go over well with the brokies in the Facebook boxing groups and the brokies online on boxing Twitter, but to the people that matter, the people with money and use it to pay to see boxing, that doesn't matter. Canelo has two losses, and it doesn't stop him from being a bigger draw, a bigger star, and a more accomplished fighter than you were. What do you think, that when he retires, he's not getting in the Hall of Fame? You'd have to be pretty naive to think that Andre Ward taking shots, taking shots openly at Canelo Alvarez has anything to do with Andre's affinity for the all-time greats, the Mexican legends. Canelo Alvarez is a four-division, two-time lineal, two-time ring magazine, former unified, current reigning, undisputed champion. How could he not be ranked among them? He's the first Mexican undisputed champion in the four-belt era and the very first undisputed champion at super middleweight. How could you not rank Canelo among those fighters? Canelo Alvarez himself, on people suggesting that he's quote-unquote ducking David Benavidez, yeah, it always happens. Eris Lundy Lara, Austin Trout, Floyd Mayweather, Miguel Cotto, Gennady Golovkin, Daniel Jacobs, Callum Smith, Billy Joe Saunders. At the end of the day, I beat practically all of them. If I beat Benavidez, they're gonna say, oh, why don't you face this other guy? Look at my history. I've done everything in boxing. I've done it all. Some say that Canelo doesn't really deserve that status because he's had close fights, close fights that could have gone the other way, like the first Golovkin fight. But need I remind you that you could say the exact same thing about any variety of all-time great fighters. Need I remind you that many said Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. robbed Colonel Whitaker and Floyd Mayweather robbed Castillo in the first fight. Some would say the same thing about the first Maidana fight, and some would say the exact same thing about Andre Ward in the first Kovalev fight. So if you're gonna apply that logic to Canelo, to where because he had a close fight, he doesn't deserve all-time great status, 
That has to apply to them. That would have to apply to them, too, because they had close fights. Try as they might, it doesn't work one way. The pendulum swings both ways. Canelo states, there isn't a concrete name on the table yet for me. He's been busy traveling and handling his business. When asked about Benavidez's fight in September, Canelo said, we'll see. But he's here to make the best fights. Says if Benavidez has to wait to make the fight, the fight will end up being bigger for later than September. I've got a suggestion. How about a Canelo versus Andre Ward fight while we wait? Why don't Andre Ward dust his gum shield, boxing shoes, and boxing gloves off? Come out of retirement and fight Canelo. I don't think he can make 168 anymore. See if you can make 175, and I guarantee you Canelo beats him. I guarantee you Canelo beats him because Andre Ward, in spite of being a defensive specialist in his day, in spite of being a pure boxer, he wasn't your according to Hoyle pure boxer. He wasn't actually an outside fighter. He was a mid-range to inside fighter who relied on catching and shooting in the pocket to break down the opponent. And at 37 years old, yeah, I don't think he's got it anymore. Catching and shooting in the pocket relies on speed, reflexes, and timing. And at 37 years old in the pocket with Canelo, yeah, I think he gets sat on his back pocket. Andre Ward is not above being sat on his back pocket. Darnell Boone sat him down and Sergey Kovalev sat him down. down. I think Canelo would sit him down. If he wants to put his money where his mouth is, come out of retirement and fight Canelo in May. Schedule yourself. A little tune-up fight in late January or early February. Dust yourself off and get ready for Canelo in May on Cinco de Mayo. You're wondering why I'm not stressing more about David Benavidez? It's because I've read that book before. I've read that book where everybody gets all excited about the new unbeaten fighter, the shiny new unbeaten guy that Canelo Alvarez will supposedly never fight just for Canelo to end up fighting him. I've already learned my lesson when it comes to that. I've been there and done that. So we'll get around to David Benavidez. Come on out, Andre. Let's play. Come on. You were a champion at 168 like Canela. You were a champion at 175. Come on, you didn't naturally pick a guy. Come on, you got so much to say. Come on! Let's get ready to rumble! Come on, Andre. You've been throwing shade on the sidelines for years. What do you want to do? You want to fight this guy or you want to fight this guy? What do you want to do? You picked Caleb Plant to knock him out. Just so that when Canelo knocks him out, you pretend that Canelo hasn't fought anybody good? He hasn't fought anybody? He's being strategic? To put yourself a flight, come out of retirement. Come show us some of your strategies, Andre. Guess this same Canelo Alvarez, because it's not Dimitri Bivol you're calling out, or Artur Betabiv, who's a unified Ring Magazine lineal champion the same way you were at that weight. You're not sat around talking about how overrated they are. Your focus is Canelo. Canelo will sit you on your back pocket, Andre. He'll knock you out. Yeah, sit on the couch. Tell Stephen A. Smith how you feel. Say it with your chest. Just payday, payday. You want payday? I know that. All these guys do. All these unbeaten fighters are supposed to be God's gift of fucking boxing, but they can't move the needle to save their life. They just want a payday, and so does Andre. It's not what this is about. 